It's good to be with you, and uh, good to be starting a new sermon series this morning. As Rob's already said, I'm going to be talking about decisions, uh, because we all make a lot of them. Uh, so I'll get on to that in a little while. Uh, just thought I'd share a couple of things with you as we start to think about decisions that we make. Uh, some of them might be rash decisions. Um, let me tell you a little story to kick us off. An iron company manager, while touring his company, noticed a young man leaning against the wall doing absolutely nothing. He approached the young man and said in a real soft voice, he said, how much do you earn? The young man says, in a calm, surprised sort of way, he said, I earn about 1,200 pounds a month. The manager said to him, well, he actually took out his wallet and uh, this is the sort of man he was, must have been quite flush. He took out 1,200 pounds, gave him the money, and says, that's your severance pay. I'm terminating your employment. He said, I want you to leave the building right now. So again, in a sort of bewildered way, the chap just picked up his things and he went. And um, one of the other workers came to the manager and he says, uh, do you know who that guy was? He says, well, no, I don't. He says, he's the sandwich delivery man. <laughs> we, we do make rash decisions at times, don't we, without looking at the, the consequences. It costs them on 1,200 pounds. But anyway, um, I spoke to a young couple this week, and um, they said that they'd come to a conclusion, and they'd made a really difficult decision in their life uh, that they didn't want to have children. They said they didn't really think it was for them. So if you'd like to leave your details with them, they'll drop them off this coming week. <laughs> and final one. Just got to share this with you. Um, Jacob, I, you see, Rob's read some bands out this morning, so I, I thought we're into the wedding season. Um, so this is about an elderly couple that are wanting to get married. Jacob's 92, and his future wife is 89. And... Um, they go for a stroll to discuss the sort of wedding arrangements. And as they're out walking, um, they pass a chemist's shop. And Jacob looks at the shop and he suggests that they go in. So he says to his future wife, he says, do you mind if we go in the shop? And she says, no, it's okay if you want to do. So they go in, speak to the pharmacist, and uh, Jacob says to the pharmacist, he says, do you own the pharmacist's shop? He says, yes, I do. So Jacob says, we're about to get married, and um, I was just wondering, do you do art medication? He says, yes, we do art medication. He says, what about circulation medicine? Do you do circulation medicine? He says, yes. He says, what about medicine for rheumatism? He says, definitely. Medicine for sort of memory problems, do you do those? He says, oh yes, lots of memory, memory uh, drugs, he says. And they work as well. He says, what about um, sleeping pills and uh, vitamins and Parkinson's disease? He says, got all those. He says, what about wheelchairs and walkers? He says, we do all speeds in all sizes. He says, can I ask why? Jacob says, well, we're thinking about nominating you as our wedding shop. Not quite um, some of the wedding shops that you get, um, John Lewis, but nevertheless, I think we should pray after that, don't you? Let's uh, pray that God might speak to us in a different way. So Father, we just thank you for uh, humor. We thank you the way that you smile upon us each and every day. And we pray now, Lord, that you'll open our ears to what you might have to say to us about making decisions in our lives, because some of them are difficult, some of them are easy. And some of them we're just not sure about. We procrastinate a lot. So just be with us this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to start with, uh, with this from Isaiah uh, 43, uh, verses 18 and 19. And Isaiah says this. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. He said, see, I am doing a new thing. 
And I believe, as um, I think Sue prayed when we, just before the service commenced, uh, she was praying about things that had happened this week. We, we have the youth in on Friday evening, absolutely fantastic. We're seeing God moving in new ways. Um, sometimes you just got to be aware that he is moving and, um, and open your eyes to see it. You know, he says that we need to open our eyes at times and we need to open our ears to hear what he is actually saying. And I believe that this verse is really true for where we are as a church at this moment, that he is doing new things. And if we look around, we will see those new things that he is doing. So here's a question to you this morning. What do you think the difference is between people that have a fulfilled life and people that don't seem to be fulfilled? You know, the people that, like, have got really great relationships, and as you look around, you see people, you see couples that are in absolutely fantastic relationships. You see people that are absolutely financially sound. You see other people that have got really meaningful ministries in whatever ministry that they're doing, but it seems to be really meaningful for them. And we get other people that seem to just love life. doesn't matter what life throws at them, they just seem to love it. Now, what's the difference between those people and the people that are on the opposite ends of the scale, the people that struggle with life, the people that struggle with relationships, the people that struggle with finances? I'm not really going to give you the answer, but I'm going to give you what it is not. It is not intelligence. Because how many intelligent people do you see that are a real in sort of dire straits with the finances. You know, they've got more degrees than you can shake a stick at, but still they can't get life together. So it's not that. It's not their appearance. How many absolutely fantastic looking people do you see that can't hold down a good relationship? So it can't be our appearance, and it can't be our intelligence. What about talent? There's a lot of talented people who can't make it in life. So it can't be talent either. So what might it be? You know, I've seen a lot of people that are miserable, a lot of people that are broke, a lot of people that can't, as I say, hold down relationships. And I think it all boils down to decisions, the decisions that we make in life. A lot of it boils down to these decisions. We need to be making good decisions in our lives. So let me, let me share this quote with you. The quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life. The quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life. You see, the problem is, I don't think that we are good decision makers. We're always making bad decisions in our life. I think we eat more. Who has eaten more this week than they probably ought to have? quite a few of us. See, we're bad decision makers. Who has bought something in the last month that you couldn't really afford? Well, there's always one hand. <laughs> Your husband's, oh, two of you, so you probably, it's probably the same thing, is it? <laughs> or you'll be saying to each other now, what have you bought? I didn't know you'd bought that. Like, sometimes I'll say to Michelle, that looks new. And with the onset of the charity shop, do you mean there's all sorts of different things coming out? Um, when Er and Kath Totty get together in the shop, it's like, oh, look at this. This little, oh, the, yeah, the, I was in here. They go with nothing, they come out with bags. Do you know? Unbelievable. Are they good decisions? Are they bad decisions? That's what we've got to ask ourselves, you know, if it's going to do us some good. Um, we do the things that we don't really want to do. We, we, how many, how many of you have done something this week that you didn't really want to do? And one that is really something that we should think about, how many times have we hurt somebody that we love? And, and we do that unknowingly, don't we? We don't want to hurt the people that we love, but we do it because it's just the way we are. It seems to be the way that we wire as people. We're not good decision makers. Um, we make lots of bad decisions in life. 
Uh, weeks ago, I talked about um, having double glazing fitting. If you remember, when we got stuck in the house because we decided to have this double glazing fitted by this firm that told us that they would seal the house and there would be no drafts. And if you was here a couple of weeks ago, you'll remember that they put silicon seal around the door and uh, we couldn't get out. They told us to stay in the house for 24 hours. And when we come to open the doors, we, we couldn't get out of the house. It was a bad decision on our part to actually believe this guy. <laughs> but the thing is, when I'm thinking about making a purchase now, I don't make rash purchases. Well, not normally anyway. I'm normally a little bit more conscious about making a purchase, especially if it's an expensive purchase. You know, if it's a little purchase, I might think, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. But if it's an expensive purchase, like purchasing a car, Michelle will be saying to me, come on, you, should we just buy it? You know, it goes on for days. It might even go on for weeks that I'm working out. Is this the best deal? And we spend time in doing that. And I think that, you know, we do learn from the bad instances that we've had in life. And I think we can learn from life. I think every day is a school day. I'm always saying that every day is a school day for us. So we need to learn from those bad situations that we've been in. I remember when I was uh, working a long time ago, probably about 30 years ago, um, installing security systems. And um, I turned up at this um, shop uh, with outbuildings. And me and the person that was working for me, uh, we started to wire um, this security system in this particular um, set of buildings. And we spent about half a day taking all these cables from one point in the building to another point. I got to lunchtime and we realized that we couldn't go any further with these cables because the, the building that I thought that they joined together was actually, they weren't really, jo well, they were joined together, but there was a, a fair distance apart. And uh, we then had to take out all what we'd done in the morning and then we had to redo it in the afternoon. We made a bad decision, and it cost us a full day's pay, if you like, for both of us. Well, it cost me because I was paying the guy. But you know, we do make rash decisions. We set off uh, doing things that, without really thinking about it. So here's a question to you. Why do we struggle to make good decisions? Something to think about, isn't it? And I believe it's because of this that we're overwhelmed with choices. Um, a cognitive scientist has said in a paper that I read that we, we probably make over 35,000 decisions a day. Loads and loads of choices. And um, it's non-stop from getting up in the morning to going to bed at night, we're making decisions. And uh, if you're like me, I was lying awake this morning thinking, what will I have for my breakfast as I'm lying in bed? So that's my first decision. Well, I suppose one decision is, why is it only 5.30 in the morning and I'm, and I'm wide awake? Um, should I stay in bed or should I get up? If I get up, what am I going to do? And I'll get up and have my breakfast, so what should I have for breakfast? So, you know, there's, there's a umpteen decisions already been made before we've even got out of bed. And um, the cognitive scientist actually says that too many decisions create decision fatigue. So we're fatigued because we're making too many decisions. So what happens is that you go to work or you go about your daily business and we're making hundreds and thousands of decisions all day long. When we come to the end of the day, we are fatigued and we start to make bad decisions. Perhaps we should hold our PCC meetings in the morning and not in the afternoon or in the evening. If you're wondering what a PCC is, it's a parochial church council, and we meet like once a month to decide what the church is doing. We talk about what coffee we should use and how many bins that we should have outside, and that seems to be sometimes all that we talk about, where we really should be thinking about the missional part of the church and what we should be doing. But, and we get fatigued in, in talking about the mundane stuff. So when we have a PCC meeting, the first with five new members of our PCC in like two weeks' time, a week on Tuesday, I'm going to swap it round. We're going to start and talk about mission first because that's the most important thing that this church should be thinking about. Let's talk about coffee and bins afterwards if we've got time. Let's look at mission first. You know, as the volume of decisions increases, the quality of our decisions decreases. 
And I think it really does. Our decisions all day long, and then we come home, and what do we start doing? We start binge eating or binge drinking, don't we? We start watching telly, and we start, I'll have a bag of crisps. I'll have an orange. I'll have this. I'm all right all day long. I get home in the evening, and I sit down when I get the remote control. And you all know I get the remote control at 9 o'clock after all the other things have been on. Well, actually, I got the remote control early last night because there were absolutely nothing on. So I did find a film, but we'll come on to that in a bit. Um, you know, we make wise financial choices. We think we do. Um, and then, as I've said earlier, you know, it can take me two weeks to make a choice. I've got a bag that I bring my iPad and stuff in. And for months and months, I was, I was investigating where I could buy a bag from. And you think, of all things, you know, it's a simple bag at the end of the day. But I wanted a leather bag, and I didn't want to pay a lot of money for it. So I looked all over. Could I find one? They're about £150, £180, £200 for a leather bag. Anyway, we went to Spain on holiday, and I saw this bag for a, on a market stall. And um, I looked at it, and I buys it, and it was about £40. And I thought, wow, absolutely, I've done the deal. You know, the deal of the century, I've got like a 200 pound bag for 40 quid, and I was absolutely made up. And we, we're walking around the market stall, and me in this like aura of like, I've done a good deal, I seize another bag. <laughs> and, I was, and then I got, I got somebody to convince me that this is the bag I should have bought, and I ended up with two bags. So after spending two weeks in making a really conscious decision about what I was going to do, so in effect, it cost me 80 quid at the end of the day anyway, because I ended up buying two. Anyway, I've got one and Joseph's got one now, so it's okay. So it went to good use. You know, um, and quite often, uh, as being Christian, uh, that's, that's something that slows us down in our thought process about making good or bad decisions. So this is number two. We're afraid of making wrong choices sometimes because we want to make Christian choices in our lives. I know somebody that actually takes the car to have it serviced at a Christian garage. Now, I've asked myself, so what's the best thing to do? To take my car to a Christian garage that might be quite a few miles away or to take my car to a local garage that's non-Christian and talk to the chap who's going to service my car, when, he, when I go to pick it up and, he, and I've got like a little fish on the windscreen, and when he turns the car on, he's going to get UCB radio, because that's what my car radio's always tuned into. And he, hopefully, if he doesn't turn the radio off, he's going to hear some Christian music. So what's the best? I'll leave that one with you. You know, sometimes we're just afraid of missing God's call and because we're afraid of missing God's call, we just procrastinate and we don't make the decision. You know, we do want the best for our children, so we want the very, very best school. St. James is a really good school now. It didn't used to be a few years ago, but absolutely fantastic now. Um, you know, it's gone, gone amazingly better than it was. But we do. We want to make the right choices for everything that we do, but don't let it drag you down. That's what I'm saying this morning, you know, because we'll never make any choices if we're just thinking about them. We do need to get on with it at times. We do need to make the choices. And we do need to go with what you believe God is actually saying to you. You know, earlier on, I was saying and praying that God would open our eyes and that we can actually see what he's doing. We can see what he's doing around church. When we look around church, when we can see uh, the amount of people that are coming to our food pantry and sitting and chatting and having coffee and cake afterwards, and we never got that six months ago. The amount of people that are coming to the girls' hangout and the Friday night thing that for the youth, absolutely amazing. Things are moving in the area of West Bradford, and not just in this church. I'm talking about the area of West Bradford. And we need to think more about the area of West Bradford and not just about ourselves here in St. James because it's not just about us. It's about what God is doing in the vicinity. And he might not do it all in this place. He might not do it all in this village. He might be doing it in Ollerton. He might be doing it at Clayton. He might be doing it up the road at Keelum. He might be doing it at Furweather Green. Gloria is actually presiding at St. Peter's at Ollerton today, if you're wondering where she is. That's why I did the Eucharist this morning. 
um, because we're sharing out a little bit of the ministry because it's all about what we need to do in this area, not just in this place, but in this area to further God's kingdom and to work where we believe God is calling us to work. Let me just put this on the screen for you. Every indecision is a decision. And it is, isn't it? You know, when we indecide to do something, we actually are deciding to procrastinate and not actually do it. So every indecision is a decision at the end of the day. So when we can't work out what we want to do on PCC in two weeks' time, that indecision is actually a decision. But we're not going to indecide. We're going to definitely decide what we're going to do uh, and how we move forward and how we progress you know, in the past, I think leadership, not just in PCCs, in churches, but leadership in all walks of life has just suffered from indecision. We need to just decide what we're going to do, and we need to get on, and we need to do it. And uh, what about this? Your emotions. Quite often, it's our emotions, especially in church situations, it's our emotions that take over. You know, we don't want to upset people, so we don't say anything. And that upsets people because we don't speak. So, you know, just might as well say the truth because, as I'm always saying, it's the truth that sets us free. You know, at the end of the day, it is the truth that sets us free. It's, it's that realization what God wants from us as individuals and how He's going to move us forward in what we're doing. And it's that truth of when we realize that that will release the church into new ministries. And that's what we need to be thinking about in this next period of the life of the church. Um, I was talking about getting the remote control earlier, wasn't I? And I did get it earlier last night. I don't know, about 7 o'clock. And Michelle said, yeah, there's nothing on. You have a look what's on TV. So I goes on to Netflix, and I couldn't find anything. We scroll through pages and pages and pages of films, and I was overwhelmed by choice and the ones that I'd already seen. Now, I thought to myself, if these films were just on normal TV, do you remember when we used to have ITV and BBC? And then we got BBC Two, didn't we? And then that new, that new channel came out, Channel Four. And it was like, what? We've got four channels on our telly. And you have to have your, your, your um, TV is retuned by somebody at one point to be able to get these extra channels. And when there was a film on those one, two, three, or four channels, you just looked at the title and you just put it on because there weren't much choice. But now we've got the choice of Netflix. We've got this bombardment of information and we can spend longer, actually, trying to decide what to watch, or reading the synopsis that doesn't tell you an absolute blind thing about the film. It tells you who's in it and who's been nominated for an Oscar but it doesn't tell you anything about the film. And by the time I put the film on, eventually, half an hour later, it's time for me to go to bed. So there's loads, there's loads of films. When I scroll through, there's loads. When I think, oh, that looks interesting, and I press it, and it's got like half of the film has been watched, and the other half has not been watched. I can't remember what they are. So just, you know, just one of those stupid things. We overanalyze what doesn't matter. That's what I'm trying to say. We overanalyze the things that don't really matter to us, and we underanalyze the things that we should be doing. You know, what's God calling us to do? That's what we should all be thinking about. What's He calling us to do? It's nothing to do with our age and our ability, because if we're not wholly mobile, God will call us into a ministry that will suit the condition that we're in. You know, He might call you into prayer ministry if you've, if you've got a mobility issue. I don't know what he's calling each and every one of you to do, but he's calling all of us to do something. He might be just calling you to share your faith stood at the bus stop next time you're getting on the bus into town. And uh, it might be that, you know, somebody misses the bus or you miss the bus and have to wait for the next one. And the reason behind that is because somebody's going to come for the next bus who you need to talk to. And that, that just happens. That's a, that's a God incident. And we need to be looking out for the God incidents, not thinking, oh, damn, I've missed my bus. Think, why have I missed my bus? There might be an ulterior motive here. You know, we often react to the things of the moment, don't we? Um, like when somebody cuts you up in traffic, we react in the moment. 
You know, you probably say, I wish that person would go to hell. Well, you should be really praying for them that they would go to heaven because there might be something going on in their life. Michelle is repeatedly telling me and reminding me about these people that cut me up in Bradford that they might have something else going on in their life. Their, their life might be so hectic and busy that they need to get from point A to B, or they're just reckless. And if they're just reckless, we need to pray for them. And what about the kids? You know, when the kids are screaming and yelling, you know, our, our logic says be patient with them, but our emotion says that we yell back to them. And that's what happens, isn't it? We see it. We see it in the supermarkets when, you know, when the kid's playing up at the till and the mother's getting really agitated. Logic says be calm. You know, we're all children at one time. You know, we do get tempted in our lives as well. It might be an emotional temptation. Logic says that we shouldn't do anything and that we should be wise. But emotion says, well, do we deserve it? Do we deserve that affection that we might get from someone else? Don't make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions. That's what I'm saying. Because they are temporary. Because the quality of our decisions, as I said earlier, determines the quality of our lives. One of the best ways to live is forward-looking, people-loving, and God-glorifying. That's what we need to be doing in our lives, those three things. Forward-looking. Yes, we've had the past, and the past sets us a good foundation for the future, but we need to be looking forward. We need to be looking at what God wants for us tomorrow, not what He gave to us yesterday. And we want to be thankful for that, but we need to be looking forward and to move forward in all that He's got for us. We need to be loving the people around us, and we need to be glorifying Him. It's not for our glory, it's for His glory. That's why we do the things that we do. When we need to decide what we're going to do now when a situation arises later. I said to Brian yesterday when we put these slides on the computer and I was just whipping through them with Brian, I says, I've probably spent an hour or so putting these slides together with these little people on that seem to be wondering what it's all about. And I says, but we need to, we need to be at a point in our lives that if we come in church tomorrow and the IT system doesn't work, that the projector doesn't work, that we don't run around like headless chickens like we have done in the past, and we have done this on a Sunday morning going, oh, it won't work, is it this plug, is it that plug? And uh, going in and getting another laptop from next door and, and plugging it in and doing all that. Wouldn't it be easier to pre-decide to say, look, if the IT system doesn't work, it's not going to affect what I've got to say. It's not going to affect the way that we have communion with each other. And at worst case scenario, there's some Bibles on the seats of the pews, and we can pick a Bible up and we can read from one of the Gospels the story of Jesus having supper with his disciples. What better liturgy is there than that? So we don't really need the words on the screen. So we can pre-decide, if this happens, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm not going to panic. If I've got a flat tire on my car, pre-decide, are you going to change the tire? Or if you're in the AA, or are you going to get them to come and change it for you? Predecide. You know, I've seen so many people trying to change a tire on their car, and they've spent an hour trying to get the old wheel off to get the new one on. Predecide. Call the RAC. Call the AA. Be a member of one of those one of those rescue companies who's going to do the job for you, and it's going to take all the tension out of our lives. Why do we live in a world full of tension when we don't really need it? That's what I'm saying. Predecide, because the power of predeciding is what I had on the screen a minute ago. <laughs> and uh, there we go. The power of predeciding is a thing that we need to do. So, as followers of whatever we're doing in our lives, I'm going to share this from Proverbs 16 with you. Um, in Proverbs 16, it says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. So just think about what we might come up against in the future and commit it to God and say, Look, God, if I'm in this situation, will you just help me out? And I'm sure that He will, because He says so, and I believe Him. 
we see in the Bible that there's um, people that had predecided what they was going to do. They predecided that they'd got such a love for God that if they were plunged into a situation, that they would they would know what to do. And we've got great examples. Do you know uh, we've got Abraham who was asked by God to sacrifice his son. And yes, it must have been traumatic at the time, but I think that Abraham had predecided that when God asked him to do something that he would do it and I'd be faithful to God. Now that's a really big issue, isn't it? To say to God, look, I believe that you're going to tell me some stuff and when you tell it to me, I'm going to do it. That's the power of predeciding, and Abraham did that, and God said to him, look, I want you to sacrifice your son, and he was going to go through with it until God realized how faithful he was, and he took that burden away from him. And then, you know, in Genesis 6 and 9, uh, we've got the story of Noah, and again, Noah had predecided that he was a, a true follower of God, and he would do what he believed God Asked, would be asking him to do throughout his life. And then God gives him this, this vision to build this boat 300 cubits long. Now, that's about a foot and a half for every cubit, so that's like 500 foot long. Now, about six months ago, we was in Lidl, and in the middle of Lidl, they've got all this wonderful stuff. Those men love it. Power tools. So about six months ago, I ended up one day, well, it, it wasn't on the day I saw it. I came home, thought about it, procrastinated for three days. Then I went back and I made my choices, and I, I, I bought a cordless um, SDS power drill, which I've used no, no end. It's absolutely fantastic, really good. And I bought a cordless saw to go with it, same battery, same charger. And I also bought a cordless um, chainsaw to cut some trees down. So I bought all these power tools. Can't have too many power tools if you're a man. Anyway, thinking about this and thinking about Noah, when Noah said to God, I'll do anything you ask me to do, and he says, build this boat 500 foot long, he'd not been down to Lidl or Aldi's or even Wicks or wherever. He had to build this thing with his bare hands and the, the tools that he'd made for himself. No power tools. But yet he builds this boat 500 foot long. And there is a place, um, if you go on the internet, you'll, you'll find um, that somebody has actually made a replica of this boat to the exact size that it says in the Bible. And it's absolutely enormous. It's like a museum. You can go and visit it. Can't remember what country it's in. But absolutely just amazing to think that somebody would predecide that they were going to follow God to the ultimate like ends of, of whatever He asks us to do and just do it. And these guys did it. And then in 1 Daniel, we, we see that Daniel and his friends are like taken off to a foreign land and they're like brainwashed, but they're put in a really good position. But the king wants them to like eat his food. And Daniel had already predecided that he wasn't going to defile himself. He was going to follow what God wanted him to do in everything. So he goes to the king and he said, I'm sorry, I can't eat your food. And he says this in 1 Daniel 8. He says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he goes to the king and he says, I can't eat it because it's dishonoring to my God. And everything's fine. He predecided. So what I'm saying to you is, you know, make clear decisions in your life. Predecide what you're going to do this week. Predecide what you value in life. You know, there's loads of things that um, you could ask yourself about valuing. What do you value in life? I don't know what you value. I know what I value in life. But what do you value in life? Do you value your relationships? Do you value what you believe God is saying to you and where he's leading you and what he wants you to do? It's your decision. And I'm going to leave you with that decision this morning. When your values are clear, your decisions are easier. And this is the power of predeciding what we're going to do under God. So let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for them stories again of these people in the Bible like Noah and Daniel and Abraham who had predecided to put all their trust in you no matter what. And Lord, we'd love to be people like them. We'd love to be people like the people that we read in the Old Testament. We know the Old Testament's not about us, but it's for us, and we see it in these three people that we've mentioned this morning, giving us real thoughts of who we can be in ourselves as we move into this new covenant with you. So, Lord, just just speak to us. Just help us to pre-decide what we are going to do for the rest of our lives. So come, Holy Spirit, and do that right now. Help us to make good choices in life, to make rightful decisions. Come, Holy Spirit, just be with us. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, as we go from this place today, we, we pray that today we'll make good decisions, that this week we'll make good decisions. And for the rest of our lives, and especially for our PCC that's coming up in two weeks' time. As we move forward with a new leadership. And we do it all for the glory of you, Lord. And we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.